This video is about class 12, chapter 10, Human Settlements. Now the meaning of the words human settlements is a place or a location where human beings reside. The cities that we all live in, it's called a human settlement. Villages are also human settlements. Even tribal areas where certain tribe reside, that's a human settlement. So this chapter also brings out the essence of this entire book. As you can see, this book is named as Fundamentals of Human Geography. Therefore, a chapter about human settlements is a mandatory topic. The study of human settlements is basic to human geography because the form of settlement in any particular region reflects human relationship with the environment. Now what I mean by that is, tribal people will stay at a place where there is availability of natural resources for their survival. Farmers in village will stay near fertile plain or where there is availability of water for irrigation. In cities, we would like to stay at a place where there are jobs. Now think from a business point of view. If you were to open a factory or an industry, your choice of location will be dependent on availability of resources or raw materials. So this is what I mean when I say settlement in any particular region reflects human relationship with the environment. Now we go to the topic classification of settlements. Rural urban dichotomy. The meaning of the word dichotomy is duality, dividing into two parts with opposite views. We all know that human settlements have been divided in terms of rural and urban, but there is no way to define what is a village and what is a town. I mean, we generally make a differentiation based on development, modernization, etc. But that's not the way to judge because there are villages in developed countries that have the same or sometimes better facilities than a town of a developing country. Similarly, population size cannot be taken as a method to call a place, village or town because many villages in India and China have more population than some towns of Western Europe and United States. So the only difference between towns and villages is that in towns, the main occupation of people is related to secondary and tertiary sectors, that is working in factories or multinational corporations, while in the villages, most of the people are engaged in primary occupations such as agriculture, fishing, lumbering, mining, animal husbandry, etc. Again, the funny thing is that presently in developed countries, large sections of urban population prefer to live in villages, even though they work in the city. So there's always this kind of opposing views. So differentiation between rural and urban based on their functions is more meaningful than seeing it from population size or which one is more developed point of view. Another good example is that petrol pumps are considered as a lower order function in the United States, while it is an urban function in India. There are very few petrol pump outlets in rural India. By this example, it is clear that even functions of rural and urban area of country depends on its regional economy. Facilities available in the villages of developed countries may be considered rare in villages of developing and less developed countries, which is very true. So this is the dichotomy of rural and urban settlements. It is that we don't have a clear classification that defines a village or a town. Many of you have suggested that I should go through these tiny boxes in between as they sometimes contain valuable information. So let's go through it. Now what is suburbanization? So there's a word urbanization in it. Basically we are talking about urban people who live in places that are outside the city to avoid congested urban lifestyle. You don't want the noise, traffic, pollution. So you decide to live in outskirts where there are not many people living. So that is what is called a suburbanization. Now we go to the topic, types and patterns of settlements. Meaning, if we were to travel in a plane and see a particular town or a village or a city from above, how will it look like? So basically, you'll see a particular shape or a pattern in which houses are constructed in a neighborhood. So broadly, they are classified into two types. The first one is compact or nucleated settlement. In these settlements, you'll see houses are constructed close to each other. So if you look at the houses to your left and right, they are not very far from your house's compound wall. Sometimes they are so close that you can touch their house wall. So this is what is the meaning of compact, close and tightly packed. And the word nucleated can be understood from the word nuclear family, meaning a small compact family. In a nucleated settlement, buildings are very close enough like a cluster, colony sort of a thing. Mostly the people in compact and nucleated settlements have similar occupation, meaning they are engaged in same sectors. So if you look at your colony, you'll find largely most of the people are working in tertiary sectors like multinational corporation or government sector or some businesses, etc. These all are tertiary sector. 
Similarly, in villages, you'll see people engaged in farming activities or fishing, lumbering, mining, animal husbandry, etc. So collectively, these all are primary activities. So this is what I mean when I say in a compact or nucleated settlement, people share common occupations. Now the second type of settlement is dispersed settlements. In these settlements, houses are spaced far apart and often you'll see large fields in between houses. The meaning of the word dispersed is scattered. Usually you'll see a nice landscape and then few houses here and there, making it a perfect and ideal location to live in. You'll get to see these settlements in places like England, Switzerland, Scotland, Russia, Australia, Scandinavian countries, some parts of Africa, western parts of USA, etc. In India, you'll find such settlements in regions of north and northeast, usually hilly regions. And the only thing that brings all the people living in these places together is a cultural feature such as a place of worship or a market where people can get groceries and interact with each other. So these were the two major types of patterns of settlements. Now we go to the topic rural settlements. By the word rural, we can easily figure out that their primary occupation includes activities like agriculture, animal husbandry, fishing, etc. Houses in rural areas are usually small and very close to each other, meaning compact. So let's read about factors that affect the location of rural settlements. The first one is water supply. Due to their primary agricultural and fishing needs, usually rural people like to reside next to a water body like a river, lake or spring. Agriculture requires a lot of water and that's why it makes sense to reside near a water body. Plus rivers and lakes can also be used for transportation. The second one is land. Again, due to their agricultural needs, people in rural area also like to settle near fertile lands because it is suitable for agriculture. That's why many places around the world have settlements at low-lying valley where rivers tend to flow. Plain low-lying areas are suited for wet rice cultivation. The third one is upland. While rural settlements have been at low-lying valleys, but to avoid flooding, people often chose to settle at terraces and levees, which are dry points. Plus, you also want to protect yourself from insects and animals. So, terrace formation is a step-like landform created to avoid flooding. The fourth one is building material. Now, early villages were built with woods from the forest. Therefore, the availability of building materials near to the settlement area is an advantage. If you see the Lois Plateau in China, you'll find human beings living in caves. They're called cave dwellers. So the rocks of this plateau is serving as a natural shelter to the people of North China. Then the people living in African savanna, the grasslands of Africa, their building materials are mud bricks. In polar region, Eskimos use ice blocks to construct igloos. Therefore, the availability of building materials near to the settlement area is an advantage. The fifth one is defense. If we go back in history, many of the villages were built on hills and islands because it served as a defensive position. I mean, in war situation, the person on the hill has an advantage over the enemy. We can see this in Germany, England, even in India, most of the forts are located on higher grounds or hills. So many of the rural settlements has been influenced because of defensive and strategic location. So these were some of the factors that affects the location of rural settlements in the world. Now we are going to read about planned settlements. You can easily figure out that it's talking about a settlement which is planned. It is not something that the people chose themselves randomly. It is not like one fine day some group of people decided let's settle down in this beautiful place. So planned settlements are constructed by governments. And the reason they do is because of overcrowding of a place. So what they do is they relocate rural population permanently with some benefits like better living conditions, jobs, etc. The scheme of villagization in Ethiopia and the canal colonies in Indira Gandhi Canal, which flows through Punjab, Haryana and Rajasthan, is a good example of planned settlements. Now we are going to read about rural settlement patterns. Whenever you hear the word settlements, immediately recollect that it is talking about the way humans are settled, how their houses are constructed at a given location. There are some criteria based on that rural settlements are categorized. Now similarly, there are criteria for urban settlements too. But right now, we'll read about rural settlement. The first one is on the basis of setting. When we say setting, we mean the environment setting, the physical feature or the geographic location of rural settlement. 
you'll find villages in plain, plateau, coastal areas, mountain, forest and deserts etc. Notice, these are also physical features of a country. So this is the environment setting we are referring to. The second one is on the basis of functions. When we say function, we mean people's occupation. So generally in a rural settlement, people engage in primary activities like agriculture, fishing, animal husbandry, collecting livestock, etc. So when we say on the basis of function, we are referring to people's occupations. The third criteria is on the basis of forms or shapes of the settlements. Now this is an important point and there are sub points in it. When we say forms or shapes of these settlements, we are talking about how will a village look if we were to see it from above. I mean, what will be the pattern in which houses are laid or constructed? How will the roads look? How will the overall scenario look? Now under this, we have certain geometrical shapes and forms. The first one is linear pattern. By linear, we mean a straight line. Here the houses are located along a straight road, a railway line, river, then a canal. So from top it will look like a long straight line of houses. So this is called linear pattern. The second one is rectangular pattern. So rectangular shape depicts a box shape. Here the roads are rectangular and cut each other at right angles. From above it will look like a block of houses packed in a rectangular box. Have a look at this picture. This is what a rectangular pattern of settlement looks like. In fact, your colony is an example of rectangular pattern. The third one is circular pattern. By the word circular, you can figure out that the settlement in this pattern is somewhat in circular shape. As it is the rural settlement is compact and close to each other. Therefore from outside the villages look like a fortified wall. This kind of pattern is common in the Yamuna districts, Malwa region in Madhya Pradesh, Punjab and Gujarat. The fourth one is star-like pattern. They look something like this. Here if you see, several roads from different directions converge and houses are constructed along the road in all direction. This pattern is common in both villages and towns. The fifth one is T-shaped, Y-shaped, cross-shaped settlement or cruciform settlement. T-shaped settlement can be seen near a tri-junction. And Y-shaped settlement can be seen when two roads converge into one. Then cross-shaped or cruciform settlement can be seen near a crossroad or a chorasta where roads are extended in four directions and houses are constructed along these roads to form settlements. And the last one is double village. Here the settlements is on both sides of a river and they are connected through a bridge or a ferry or a small boat. So this is called a double village. So these were all the different shapes and patterns of rural settlement. Now we are going to read about problems of rural settlements. We are going to understand this topic in point-wise manner. So at first we'll talk about water problems. Supply of water to rural settlements in developing countries is not adequate, especially when rural settlements in the developing countries are large in number and poorly equipped with infrastructure. People in villages have to go long distances to fetch water. Again, lack of infrastructure is the problem. Waterborne disease like jaundice, cholera are very common. The water in rural areas is so contaminated that people in rural areas are more likely to fall sick even after getting the water through hard work. That's the condition. Then countries of South Asia suffer from drought and flood conditions. Being closer to the equator, these countries are usually warmer and that creates drought conditions. Rivers dry up, groundwater depletes, so agriculture suffers due to that. The second problem is absence of toilet and garbage disposal facilities. Most of the houses in rural settlements are made of materials like mud, wood and thatch. Now these are not very stable building materials. They can easily be destroyed during heavy rain and floods. Now these houses don't have proper drainage outlets. Due to that, household waste is let out in the open that creates serious health related problems. Many houses are designed in such a way that animals and animal fodders are stored within the house compound to protect them from wild animals. So this also creates an unhygienic condition that creates serious health related problems. The third problem is unmetalled roads and lack of modern communication network. During rainy season, the rural settlements remain cut off and pose serious difficulties in providing emergency services. The fourth problem is inadequate health and educational infrastructure. Now health and education is the most basic facility that is required to turn human into human resource. Without education, how can knowledge and skills be imparted? And without proper health facilities, how can people be healthy and contribute towards economy and growth? So these are some of the many growing concerns of rural settlements. 
government and policy makers have to constantly look for ways to tackle these issues because these settlements are growing rapidly and problems may just increase before any necessary steps are taken. So this was all about the rural settlements. We now move on to the second part, urban settlements. These are places where most of you and I reside. Here's an interesting fact. The first city to reach the population mark of 1 million is the London city. Till 1810 to 1982, almost in a span of 170 years, approximately 175 cities in the world had crossed the 1 million population mark. Now if you look at this table, it shows the percentage of world's population living in urban areas. If you see from 1800 to 1950, for every 50 years, the urban population doubled. After 1950, the number did increase and it is increasing today as well, but the initial years were rapid compared to post-1950. Now we are going to read about classification of urban settlements. Again, there are subtopics in it, so we will look at each one of them. The first one is population size. Many countries use population size to define an area as urban area. Or sometimes they even use population density as a tool to define an area as urban area. Have a look at this table. Here are a few values of population size which are considered by countries to define area in their territory as an urban area. Now apart from population size, in India we consider population density, that is the number of people living in per square kilometer size of non-agricultural land. You see non-agricultural land is important. Agriculture is a primary activity and we are talking about urban area where secondary and tertiary activities are considered. So in India we consider population density as one of the criteria apart from population size as an indicator for determining an area as an urban area. The second one is occupational structure. We have read in this chapter that the urban population mostly engages in non-agricultural activities. So in India, if 75% of population of a place is engaged in non-agricultural activities, then that place is called as an urban area. Similarly, in Italy, that criteria is set to 50%. So occupational structure is one of the criteria to define a place as an urban area. The third one is administration. Now administration means civic authority. In India, any place is considered as urban if it has a municipality, cantonment board or notified area council. You will not find all these civic bodies in rural areas. The fourth one is location. Any urban area to be called so, it need to be located at a strategic location because then its true potential and function can be unleashed. For example, Goa is famous for tourists, resorts, beach vacation, scenery. Similarly, mining towns are located close to locations that have availability of raw materials. Then goods produced for export purpose has to be nearer to harbour or seaports. So this is what I mean about location playing an important role in urban settlement. Now I'm going to give you a very realistic example. Today if you see most of the IT parks, that is information technology parks in India, are located in Mumbai, Bangalore, Hyderabad and Chennai. One of the important reason is because of the location. These cities are closer to the nearest water body compared to other metro cities. And if you are aware of sea cables, these are long wide cable in the oceans connecting businesses across the world. So these cables in India are owned by Reliance and Tata Communication. And through these cables all the data from the MNCs are sent to their respective foreign headquarters. And the landing station of these cables are located at places closer to the water body. And now you know why Mumbai, Bangalore, Hyderabad and Chennai have emerged as tech capitals in India. Another point is that because of tech industry being the largest source of employment, today in India people move places because of their jobs. I hope with this example you understood the importance of location being a factor in determining a place as an urban settlement. Now we are going to read about functions of urban centers. When we say function, we mean the reason or the purpose behind having an urban center. In early times, towns used to have all administration, trade, religious, defense importance. All of these functions used to be carried out from the town centers. In the case of Mughals, they used to function and reside in Delhi. From there they practiced their rule. Then during the time of Adolf Hitler in Germany, his headquarter was based in Munich. It was a metropolitan city back in the Nazi rule. So you see the functions of an urban center was always from the point of view of trade, exercising rule and power. All of those purpose. But if we see today, there are entire different functions of an urban center. We have recreational, residential, transportation, then mining, manufacturing and information technology services are being carried out in urban centers. We all go to the central part of the city for work or availing any services. That is the importance of urban center today. 
and with time these centers functions can be changed or developed. I mean many cities in India during the British rule were having entirely different functions. But today as time passed we see these cities are no more how it used to be. So that's the diversity we are talking about. Now towns and cities are classified in the following categories. The first one is administrative towns. These are usually national capitals where the central government does its work. So have a look at this table. These are the cities where the respective country's government does its work. The second one is trading and commercial towns. Now these are the towns where you will have major trading centers and also commercial services like banking, transportation, financial centers, etc. And these are few examples of trading and commercial towns. And the third one is cultural towns. These are usually the places of pilgrimage, you know, religious importance. But there are some places where culture is not just limited to religion and pilgrimage. Culture also means work, life, fun, recreational, etc. For example, Pittsburgh in USA and Jamshedpur in India. These are industrial towns. Here iron and steel has been the major work culture of people. So for them, this is a cultural town compared to regular religious places like Jerusalem, Mecca, Jagannath Puri, Varanasi, etc. Similarly, Miami in USA and Panaji in Goa, India are fun places to be in. That's the culture of these places. So this is all about the cultural town. Now we are going to read about classification of towns on the basis of forms. You remember earlier in this chapter we read about rural settlement patterns? This is similar to that, except we will read about urban places, that is a town or a city. Even urban settlements are in the shape of linear, square, star-shaped, but then most importantly, you need to understand this that towns and cities of developed and developing countries have a little bit of differences. The cities in developed countries are usually well planned. They are the result of town planning. But then most urban settlements of developing countries have evolved historically with irregular shapes. So if you go to old Delhi, the area is still somewhat how it was before independence. There are many such towns in India that are still somewhat resembles its old style. But on the other hand, Chandigarh is a well-planned city. Though it was planned before independence, but then it falls under planned city and not a natural evolving city. If suppose 50 to 60 years ago, people just passed by a place and then eventually small markets began to develop and then we fast forward to 60 years, that place still goes on like that, you have markets, people, shops, etc. Then that's called as a naturally evolving city. Now we're going to read about types of urban settlements. They have been divided in the following category based on the function, population size and services that it offers. The first one is town. When we think of a town, we associate these functions with it like manufacturing, retail and wholesale trade and professional services. These all exist in a town. So when you look around a town which is nearer to your place, you will find everything, food, clothes, entertainment, government offices, etc. You don't need to go to a big city. I mean, you would go to a big city for some other things, but then primarily that little town near your house will serve the purpose. So that's the function of a town. The second one is city. Now cities are much larger than towns and have a greater number of economic functions. You will have more bigger functions like an airport, railway stations, then major administrative offices like municipality, income tax department, then big colleges, bank headquarters, etc. These all exist in a city and thus increases its complexity in terms of giving services. Now you and I reside in a town or a city. I want you to remember this. We know the name of a city or town where we live. The third one is conurbation. In the previous point, I said we know the name of a city or town where we live, right? Now a conurbation is a bigger city that includes all little towns and cities that you and I live in. I'll give you an example. All the metropolitan cities of India like Delhi, Mumbai, Bengaluru, Hyderabad, Chennai, Kolkata, these all are called as conurbation. Because there are these little towns and cities that together make up these big metropolitan cities. I hope you're getting what I mean. The fourth one is megalopolis. They are called as mega cities. I'll give you an example. Bengaluru, Chennai, Hyderabad, Kochi, Mysuru, Coimbatore, Vishakhapatnam, Madurai and Tiruvananthapuram. All these cities are widely separated geographically but they together form a megalopolis. You will find interconnected transport facilities and most of these places are maybe a night's journey away from each other. And the fifth type of urban settlement is million city. These are cities with population more than a million. By this definition, a megalopolis also falls under this category. A million is 10 lakhs. Just look up the population of various cities in India. Anything that's above 1 million, that's a million city. 
The number of million cities in the world has been increasing. Here's the table that shows continent-wise distribution of million cities. So if you look at this table, cities are doubling constantly every 20 to 30 years in North and Central America. In Asia, it is skyrocketing. And this is evident when we have two of the largest population countries residing in Asia. So these were the five types of urban settlements that presently exist. Now we will look at the distribution of megacities. So megacity is also known as megalopolis. This term is given if a city's population is more than 10 million people. Have a look at this table that shows all the megacities with their respective population. On your left side is the old population figure from NCRT book and on your right side it is the latest figure as per 2016. Pause and have a look at it. Now we will go to the topic problems of human settlements in developing countries. Have a look at the list of developing countries as per United Nations Development Program. So the problem that we face in India because India is a developing nation and we can stand testimony to the fact that problems like growing population, then congested housing, you will hardly find empty space near your house, then lack of drinking water, then there's a problem of infrastructure, electricity is not stable, we do face power cuts and shortages, then sewage disposal, there are still many places where household sewage goes out in the open, there's no proper drainage connection, healthcare and education is also not up to the mark. There are many who cannot afford healthcare and needless to say, how the government hospitals and schools, colleges function, there's hardly any care and quality in it. So these are the problems of human settlements in developing countries. Now we go to the last topic of this chapter, problems of urban settlements. So here we are going to read about the urban areas, the problem they face. People move from rural to urban areas in search of employment and better living. Because of this, the rural population is slowly migrating to urban areas and most of the cities in developing countries are not planned, so that creates congestion. Many people from rural area come to urban site for jobs like driving, household, maid, gardening, etc. Since they cannot afford a house, this in turn leads to growth of slums. In many cities, an increasing proportion of the population lives in substandard housing. Now there are many who live in illegal settlements. This way, so many problems pile up because there is no proper planning for distributing resources. I hope you're getting what I'm trying to say. Slum cities in Asia needs better planning because these cities are expanding rapidly and there is strong need for political will, both at national as well as local levels. Let's look at these individual problems that exist in urban settlements. The first one is economic problems. People from rural areas are moving to urban areas in search for employment. This is called rural urban migration. Now this move is continuously pushing the urban population up and rapid population growth is a huge challenge for many cities. There's going to be severe shortage of infrastructure, facilities like housing, sanitation, drinking water, education, health, etc. And on top of it, there is no proper city planning to accommodate this huge population. The second one is socio-cultural problem. When we say socio-cultural, we mean the different groups of people in society and their habits, traditions, etc. So cities in developing countries suffer from social problems because there is no planning involved. Then insufficient financial resources fail to create social infrastructure catering to the basic needs of the huge population. There is so much differentiation. Education and health facilities remain beyond the reach of the urban poor. Then crime rates are increasing because of unemployment. Then male migration to the urban areas distorts the sex ratio in cities. The third problem is environmental. Now the large urban population in developing countries not only uses but also disposes of a huge quantity of water and all types of waste materials. Many cities of the developing countries even find it extremely difficult to provide the minimum required quantity of portable water and water for domestic and industrial uses. An improper sewerage system creates unhealthy conditions. Massive use of traditional fuel in the domestic as well as the industrial sector severely pollutes the air. The domestic and industrial wastes are either let into the general sewerage or dumped without treatment at unspecified locations. So these are the environmental problems that exist in today's urban settlement. So in a nutshell, there should be a link between urban and rural settlements. And it is important for sustainability of human. But right now that's not the case. Rural urban migration is increasing, which is putting enormous pressure on urban infrastructure and services. 
the only solution is to balance urban and rural settlements and also balance their economic, social and environmental requirements. At least this way it will not create any load on the natural resources of a particular place. With this we have come to an end of this chapter. I hope you have found this video informative. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. If you want to see more of such educational content, make sure you're subscribed. By doing so, you'll get an alert when my next video comes. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.